Good evening all, how are we doing? Looks like we lost a few folks, or else we'll, they'll dribble in later. Welcome back, you hardy ones. Good to have you back. And uh, this, welcome to week three. Uh, and uh, we will begin with uh, a, a poem and a prayer. And then we'll take a look at what we hope to cover tonight and then what we hope to do in the next uh, two weeks. Are you not hearing me very well? Oh, let me speak up a little. I could try projecting better. How's that? Okay, coming up too. All righty. So, when I began the first week, I, uh, I used a poem from Mary Oliver. Uh, honey, you remember Honey at the Table? And, uh, and I wanted to bring us back to uh, Mary Oliver to start our prayer this evening. So this is her poem called Morning at Great Pond. It starts like this. Forks of light slicking up out of the east, flying over you and what's left of night. It's black waterfalls. It's craven doubt dissolves like gravel as the sun appears, trailing clouds of pink and green wool, igniting the fields, turning the ponds to plates of fire. The creatures there are dark flickerings. You make out one by one as the light lifts. Great blue herons, wood ducks shaking their shimmering crests, and knee deep in the purple shallows, a deer drinking. As she turns, the silver water crushes like silk, shaking the sky, and you're healed then from the night. Your heart wants more. You're ready to rise and look, to hurry anywhere, to believe in everything. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your Holy Spirit as it moves and shakes us into each new day. We give you thanks for the beauty of nature that helps to remind us to rise and look, to hurry anywhere, to believe in everything. We give you thanks for that Holy Spirit and for the spirit of inquiry and love of your word and love of your sacramental living that brings us here this evening. And we ask that you make us wise in our hearing and in our speaking and in our discernment. And we raise you this prayer knowing that as you hear it, you hear it through the voice of the one who is your beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love me some Mary Oliver. Just. Her, the two poems I've offered you are from American Primitive, poems by uh, Mary Oliver, which is quite an old book, actually. She has lots of even more recent poems, but she's just beautifully lyrical, manages to blend nature with human nature, um, which is something I always deeply admire. And so, as we welcome ourselves back this time, we remind ourselves that um, when we, uh, well, let's first of all just recap a little bit where we've come from. Let's see if we can do this well. So, if we're to recap our first, uh, first two weeks. We talked about sacraments, and we said sa a sacrament is that which both points to and embodies the fullness of God. Remember that? Both points to and embodies the fullness of God. And from there we went to this notion that helps us understand sacramental living, and we used the twin phrases, Christ is the sacrament of God, that is to say Christ points to and embodies the fullness of God. 
And in the same way, we aspire as church, as people of God. I like the language people of God better for, for church, because church people t- tend to think the institution or the hierarchy or the buildings. And by church, I always mean the people of God. And so we aspire as the people of God to, to be the sacrament of Christ. That is to say, to point to Christ and to embody the fullness of Christ. And when in our last two weeks together, we begin to look at how that occurs in the actual sacraments, the seven sacraments as we know them, we'll notice that in each case we're going to be trying to point to Christ and embody the fullness of Christ while becoming the most perfect of vessels, if you like. And I made the argument that in order to understand, uh, to, to be called to the fullest possible understanding of our faith, we actually really have to know Jesus. We really have to get to know what it is that is said about Jesus uh, in the biblical texts. And, um, and that's, a, that's a crucial aspect of being able to find our, our heart, able to grab the mystery and the wonder of, of Jesus. Because if it's just about Jesus of Nazareth, a man who lived 2,000 years ago, who died and then something incredible happened and, he was, and God raised him from the dead, and if we just think of it as a historical event, that's nice, but we can all go home. So we have to ask ourselves, what does it matter that Jesus Christ is risen and lives today? And how and where and what does that look like? And all of those things are part and parcel of understanding sacramentality. Christ points to God, the church, we the people of God, point to Christ in all that we do and say. I do recall after I was married for about 12 years, waking up one morning and saying to my husband, "Um, I just discovered yesterday I'm supposed to be your best possible shot at seeing the face of God every day. You're, I can't say that word, you're out of luck. You're just out of luck, (laughs) you know? Because I really had only, I had been married 12 years before I understood what the sacrament of matrimony was actually supposed to mean for me, is that I was his best shot at seeing the face of Jesus every day. Turns out I was 12 years married before I understood that. So I had to kind of do some catch up then for a few years afterwards, just to try and, you know, do some some (laughs) reparation (laughs) for years of undone Jesus. But again, that will we'll continue to kind of break that open as we go forward. But I made the point also in previous weeks that in order to fully understand Jesus, you have to understood who he, not only who he was in his heritage as a Jew of the first century who had inherited the entire tradition that he had inherited of being one of the ancient, of, of, of the Israelites, but we also have to understand the values of that culture the values of the culture of the ancient Israelite, uh, of the ancient Israelites. And I said last last week that there are two major strands that we will be able to look at as part and parcel of the spirituality and the concept of God that uh, the ancient Israelites had. And we said the first one was absolutely exodus, right? Beginning, middle, and end, the Exodus shaped the people of understanding our God is a saving God. Our God is a God who hears the cry of those who are disenfranchised, those who are left out, those who are excluded, those who are the anuim is the word that they use in Hebrew, those who are the poorest of the poor and the excluded and the most vulnerable and the voiceless among us. That is who our God is and that God will always come to the rescue, to the saving, that saving God, that salvation that God offers. So when we think of salvation in the Old Testament, we're not thinking of going to heaven. Remember, the bulk of the Old Testament did not yet have, had not yet evolved an understanding of life after death. So if our God is a God who saves, he saves us as community for the living. Your entire identity and the future, your future identity was always wrapped up in in keeping your community alive. 
allowing your community to grow to the next generation, allowing your community to survive the battle, allowing your, your community to win, win the battle, not lose the land. All of those values were very much ingrained in into the ancient uh, community of Israelites, and they saw Yahweh, God, as being very much on their side in that endeavor because of their covenant with God, that covenant that was made as part and parcel of the Exodus, that what we call the Mosaic Covenant, that's the fancy language for the covenant that God made with Moses, okay? And I pointed out to you that the covenant with Moses is typically we think of, we're used to thinking of it as the Ten Commandments, but it's actually the entire uh, segment from Exodus chapter 19 all the way through to the end of the book of, of Deuteronomy. Okay, so you, you really want to understand all of the covenantal stipulations. You read all of those chapters. And so we said this is the heritage of Jesus, this heritage that has the, the Exodus spirituality and its covenantal implications um, because of the stipulations of the covenant. And we mentioned along the way that, m that the evangelists, the gospel writers, the four gospel writers, they all understood Jesus in terms terms of this heritage and so their portrayal of Jesus was very much colored with Jesus as the fulfillment also of this heritage this these cultural values that he had and I mentioned last week just by way of giving you a teaser that Jesus was uh, in Matthew's gospel very much regarded as uh, akin to a new Moses a new bringing a new covenant upon the land creating a new a new way forward forward for the folks. So that was our first spirituality, the spirituality of the Exodus, and we didn't yet get to the second spirituality, which we will touch tonight as we lurch towards Jesus and the actual living of the sacraments this week and in the following. Sounds good so far? And before we left last time, I I mentioned that in order to understand Jesus and or in order to understand Jesus as, if you like, a new Moses, and Moses was the quintessential, the paradigmatic prophet, we have to then understand the prophets. And I sent you home saying, oh, go on, take a look at Amos. Did I not? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands and tell me whether or not you went home and plowed through the book of the prophet Amos. And I gave you Amos because Amos and Hosea, and a little bit of Micah, they're just shorter and easier to go through than me pointing you to the great, great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Z Ezekiel. That's not to dismiss them, but because this isn't a whole series on the prophets, I had to just decide where to send you, right? And so I sent you to Amos. So, if you did have a chance, Take a quick moment to tell the folks at your table if you found, remember I said find the fascinating, see if it has your name on it, if it has your name on it, apprentice yourself into that text or that set of values or that, that imagery and, uh, and take onto yourself, try to live into that which, which uh, those texts, that those passages offer you. So if you did, um, spend a moment just telling the folks at your table whether or not you got a chance to look up a few texts from Amos and if you did which ones grabbed your fancy and we'll just spend literally only two minutes two so 120 seconds to do that so talk fast he uh, so so verse um, verse 11 in chapter 9 uh, she says pointing to the restoration that we see subsequently embodied in Jesus and I would say yes but I would also say but because here's what we typically do is we stand in the Old Testament and we read the Old Testament and because we're Christian and because we understand how much of the Old Testament is, is intricately um, uh, engaged and twisted around the New Testament and, and, and helps us see the fullness in Christ that, that we know to be true, we have a tendency to stand in the Old Testament and swivel towards the future and say, Amos is writing about the future, about Jesus and how this fulfillment will come in Jesus. 
And first of all, Hebrew Bible scholars and Jewish scholars, and actually anymore, most Christian scholars would say, yes, but you're much better off to go to the New Testament and swivel backwards, okay? When you go to the New Testament and swivel backwards, what you get is this, is you get texts that describe, they want to describe the profound truth about Jesus. They want to describe what they know to be true, that God has worked in this extraordinary fashion in what he has done with the Jesus event, the, the incarnation, the life of Jesus, the, the crucifixion of Jesus and the raising of Jesus from the dead. And, and, and God has done something extraordinary in that. And they immediately said, oh my gosh, that's, that's because they know their scriptures, that's, that's, that we should have seen that coming. We should have known that was coming. And they describe the Jesus event in terms that ha bear strong echoes to what they've already seen in the, and known in the Old Testament. So you stand in the New Testament and you swivel backwards. I'll tell you the example I always used to teach, uh, used to use when I was teaching my students. You know um, River Dance? You know the, the, um, the show River Dance? Well, Billy Whelan is the, uh, is the composer of that, of that music. Um, uh, that almost sounds like Riverdance right there. <laughs> and I remember my mother calling me, um, and, uh, and she said to me, you'll never guess what Billy Whelan's after done. Billy Whelan grew up in my hometown and is my, my oldest brother's best friend. And she said, you'll never guess what Billy Whelan's got, gone and done. He's gone and written a piece of music that they, they wrote a seven, he wrote a seven minute piece and the, um, uh, and, and it, it, the result was he made Irish dance go passionate. And I said, don't be silly, mom. There's no such thing as passionate Irish dance. We all grew up, you know, on our toes, stiff as ramrods. All of the action was on the toes and a one, two, three, and a one, two, three. It's all very, very stiff. And, uh, and she said, no, really. And then, of course, they developed out of that seven minute piece an entire, an entire show that went on to become famous, et cetera, et cetera, and it's still going on. And we in our family began to talk about, about Billy like this. Well, of course, he built a piece of music around rhythm. Wasn't he always playing the drums when he was a kid? Wasn't he, oh, couldn't we see it coming? We should have, see, we stand in the now in light of what's happened and we point backwards. Well, of course, it was in the cards that he was always going to compose music that had rhythm at its base. And he was always going to do something creative with rhythm. That was always the way he was. We should have known. And so we spoke out of the 2020 hindsight vision of knowing what had happened in the big R, the big river dance moment. And so we spoke with new insight we, we even went back to his, his, his childhood. Remember, he, he was made for, gra for greatness. Do you remember how his mother always had him wear a suit, even to come over to play with us? You know, we would, again, project back to his birth almost, the imminent signs of his greatness. Now, when the evangelists composed the account of the Jesus event, they did the same thing. They had the 2020 hindsight vision of the resurrection. And because of the resurrection, they then told all of their accounts of Jesus, including those strands and those echoes from the Old Testament. And so it's the best possible way to read the New Testament is to scan it for echoes of the Old Testament and say, oh, that evangelist really picked up on those echoes from Genesis, really, really picked up on those echoes. And really, actually, we have some on the, on the um, overhead, uh, overhead, I'm dating myself, on the PowerPoint uh, for tonight. So, so you're absolutely right that New Testament writers saw in Amos's text the foretelling of the future, but it's better to go that way backwards than forwards. Does that make sense? Yes, and after you said that, um, I looked at the Bible, and it actually references in Acts, um, and then Acts actually repeats yes. Amos. That's right. 
That's right. They pick up on the themes. The, the, Luke, the author of Acts, picks up on those themes in Amos and re, uh, reprises them. Yes. Anything else? Okay, uh, Susie's gone with the mic, so speak big and loud, Frank. Does, but if they do that, does it run, don't they run the risk of wishful thinking that perhaps, okay, Jesus was this wonderful individual, human being, and oh my goodness, what he's doing and what he's saying is so similar to what the prophets mm -hmm. were saying many you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of years ago. So could he be the Messiah? And yes, he, let's, let's make him the Messiah. I mean, is, don't we run the risk though if we, if we follow that line? When biblical scholars first came to the conclusion that the New Testament writers, the gospel writers, had selected some accounts and shaped them and arranged them for the purpose of informing and, and um, building the faith of the New Testament communities, uh, many scholars, many, many Catholics actually were very resistant to that at first because of exactly that fear. Well, are we saying it's not true? Are we saying they just made it fit? And I've had this with my with students at the University of Mary and at UIW um, uh, for for years. This worry. Well, wait, wait a minute. How do we how do we know if uh, it was huge worry? Luckily, we had a marvelous thing called the Second Vatican Council, which led to new documents being written in 1994. is a very significant document called the Interpretation of the Bible in the Church. It's a a, a document for Catholics. Uh, on, written from, from the Vatican on how to understand the New Testament texts. And, and they say, you know, what we're getting in the evangelists is, uh, are, is uh, narratives about Jesus, about the profound truth about Jesus, but limited by the particular perspective of each author and told within the framework of their very understanding. I like to say to people, you can't hear me speak here without hearing my Irish heritage, my commitment to Vatican II and the documents of Vatican II. When I speak about things theological, I can't even speak outside of the framework of the Second Vatican Council because I, it's the highest document of our documentary authority of our faith and I live and breathe that. I just love it. Uh, and so you hear me and my very language that I use shapes my understandings as I pass them on to you. And we have exactly the same phenomenon in the New Testament texts. There's a marvelous book by Richard Burridge called Four Gospels, One Jesus, I highly recommend. What he does in that is he, he speaks about Winston Churchill in, his, in the opening and he says, Winston Churchill had many people write biographies about him. Some wrote about him as a writer, some wrote about him as a statesman, some wrote about him as a, I don't know, crusty, crusty father figure or something, I, I'm making it up now. But basically there were all sorts of different biographies written about Churchill, each one coming at it from a different angle and from a different lens, all of them true, but all of them from a particular perspective that actually omitted the other perspectives. And we get a lot of that in the Gospels. You're getting perspectivized vision on Jesus. As I mentioned last week, Matthew's Gospel thoroughly sees Jesus as the, uh, as, as the quintessential Moses. Not only that, but the quintessential new Moses building a new covenant for a new day. We, we all do that. You know, Pope Francis is, is again trying to reimagine the church out of the same imagery, but revitalizing the imagery for, for today. So stay, stay with the worry about it, but resist fundamentalist readings, is what I always say. Because, um, because a fundamentalist reading discounts the editorial work that was done in p putting the Gospels together. Richard, Richard Burridge, B-U-R-R-I-D-G-E is his name. So 
let's move us along since I really do actually have to get to what we're doing, doing new this week. Um, with Amos, I want to point out some of the things uh, that are um, unique, well, that are fascinating to Amos. First of all, chapter 4, did you see how he talked about the women? Hear this word, women of the mountain of Samaria, you cows of Bashan. My mother would have greatly disapproved of the name calling. He is a He's a crusty old guy. He's really, he's a heavy hitter, and he is ticked off. And what he's ticked off about, I changed this slide from last week's to be a little bit um, more relevant to today's discussion. What he's, um, what he's ticked off about is the fact that uh, because of the new, so he's an eighth century, he's an eighth century prophet. And again, actually the book itself is part eighth century, but some of it was written and edited later. But he's an eighth century prophet who is absolutely ticked that in the newly evolving um, uh, kingdoms of Israel and, and Judah, uh, um, that, um, that the world is becoming stratified, that there's, as we would say today, there's a great separation happening between rich and poor and getting larger at all, all the time. He's very, very upset at the wealth that is in the hands of a few. He's very, very upset by the fact that the economy, which was an agrarian um, tribal economy, if you like, that used to work for the common good, is because of huge land ownership, is becoming something that exploits people that don't, who don't own land. And properties are accumulated into, into huge estates. And as a result, then the kind of um, uh, agriculture that is done on the land um, is no longer an agriculture that produces food for those who are who are uh, actually harvesting um, the, the 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 fruits from the from the land. It's actually becoming, if you like, what today we would call a cash economy. That they uh, the landlords, uh, the great estate owners, had switched from um, wanting to grow consumption crops that would feed the people to luxury crops such as oil. Uh, I mean, olive olives and things that would be would benefit uh, being sold to other people and it would bring a profit in. Funny, it strikes me as if some of these same things are what we talk about today, you know? Um, there's unjust taxation. There's um, there's a use of and there's a growing use of military in order to control, and then a lot of the taxation is specifically going to keep the military in place, and then all of the energy and the and the um, uh, earnings are also going towards these lavish liturgical displays, and he's very irate. He speaks for God, so he says, "I don't know how you can possibly." Um, say that you worship me, um, God, um, while with all of these lavish ceremonies, while the weakest and the poorest among you are languishing because of the, of the structures that you're putting in place. Here's why Amos is important. Amos is very much uh, the prophet who speaks to the unjust social structures that are in place. Social structures are, that are, have to do with the kind of society, socioeconomic structures, the kind of society that we desire to build. And it is Catholic social teaching to this day based out of our concern for the, uh, for the common good and the care for the poorest among us. It is Catholic social teaching that we take care of the weakest and the most vulnerable among us. Um, I remember hearing at one stage somebody say, uh, I'll come to you in just a sec, we'll have a little conversation, uh, Judy, in just a sec. Um, the people said, a budget, you know, a budget is a moral document. And I often hear people say, oh no, there's no there shouldn't be any connection between, between religion and politics. And I say, well, our faith tells us that we care about the dignity of the human person. If we care about the dignity of the human person, we care about the structures that surround us that bring dignity to the human person. And if some of our structures remove dignity from the human, human person, then we have to get involved. And Amos is the first prophet who really, really gets into that. Susie, did you want to bring the uh, mic to uh, Judy there? No, I, I just wanted to ask her, she was, if that is the focus more now, and I think that the focus 
Mm, that's a very long answer question. Um, trying to be brief, which is not my forte, I would say that the focus after Vatican II was very much um, who are we as church from the document Lumen Gentium, and then what are we about, what are we missioned to do, which is from the other major document on the church called Gaudium et Spes, also known as the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. Uh, prior to Vatican II, I would say from Trent through Vatican I, you had a very necessary focus on the formation of the priesthood because what we don't often understand is the Council of Trent in the 1500s, what happened at the Council of, uh, prior to the Council of Trent is that priests had been terribly badly formed. They had no formation whatsoever, which led to the kinds of abuses that Martin Luther spoke about and railed against quite rightly. Right Now, that turned into a full-scale reformation that ended up with Protestantism growing, so that was a little bit perhaps more than one might have wanted to push. But leading up to, uh, prior to Trent, there, has been an, there had been an absence of formation. Between Trent and really the first Vatican Council, um, which was uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, there was this strong focus on forming a strong, worthy priesthood and getting the strong structure of the church right, because it had been loosey-goosey for so many, many years. And it, was a, it went into a bit of a kind of a frigid state, I might say, a frozen state. They did, there was not much new initiative there. At the first Vatican Council, which didn't last very long, it was interrupted by the Franco-Prussian War, so much so that at the second Vatican Council, the first action they took was to close out the first Vatican Council, because <laughs> they'd all had to rush home to get out of the way. But. Um, at the First Vatican Council, um, uh, you had uh, the declaration of the um, um, primacy of the, the Pope, the papal, papal infallibility. Right around that time, papal infallibility became a doctrine. And the problem was that people thought, oh, well, then there's nothing else that anybody has to say, because the only one who says anything in our Catholic world is, is the Pope. And they really never thought there'd be another council, which is why the Council, uh, the Second Vatican Council, 62 to 65, was such a a, a fantastic event. But yeah, good question. It was a lot around the structures and the, um, the structure of the Catholic Church rather than uh, retrieving of the mission of the first century uh, uh, disciples, which is really what we're talking about here in this peek into Amos. Very quickly, what I'd like to do is move us from Amos to Hosea, because Hosea added something that we will see also emerging in the Jesus event, in the, in the context of Jesus. Um, uh, Hosea uh, is, is another prophet. He's one of the pre-exile, pre-exilic uh, prophets. And, uh, and Hosea offers us, uh, he's from, the, he's from the, the northern kingdom, and he offers us some fascinating text, very beautiful text. And the one I, and you have it all up here on the, on the screen behind me. But I really want to point to the relevance of Hosea in the bottom right quadrant. He introduced the theological method uh, of uh, thinking about God through observing human experience. You know that song, come back to me with all your heart, that beautiful song. It's, it's Hosea pining because his wife is unfaithful to be honest, she's a little bit of a floozy. And, uh, and uh, under God's guidance, he has taken her uh, for his wife. The whole, the whole of the prophet Isaiah, uh, the, of the prophet Hosea is really meant to be symbolic of the kingdom of Israel. The kingdom of Israel has become, if you like, prostituted. It has become an Israel being, being uh, the northern kingdom. At this stage, Israel refers to the northern kingdom and Judah is the name that they give to the southern kingdom. It can be confusing because sometimes we think of Israel as the whole, the whole lot. Yeah, after the fall of, uh, after the death of King Solomon, uh, so, so for, for Kingdom of David, the kind of, the key highlight moment for the people of Israel was when they, when they had the temple. So it was King David, 
followed by King Solomon, and Solomon built the temple. And you had, if you like, the highlight of the history of Israel, which always kind of reminds me a little bit of Ireland. You know, we always say, oh yeah, we're the, we're the island of saints and scholars. Uh -huh, we were for about four years. Yeah, <laughs> okay, maybe 200, maybe 100. But then we lived off of that title for ourselves for another 800 years or 1,200 years. And in the same way, the kingdom of Israel was always what the people relied upon in their imagery and the temple in Jerusalem. And that was fine, except all of a sudden now, you had a kingdom that wasn't a full kingdom anymore because after Solomon, what happened is there's infighting, as so often happens with the sons of kings, infighting between his sons, and there's a separation between the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, uh, Judah. Just think J for Judah, J for Jerusalem. And the northern kingdom, Israel, is later what we will see encompassing um, the kingdom of Samaria in Jesus' time. The, the, the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel ends up roughly correlating to Samaria and uh, nor parts of northern Galilee, but mostly Samaria uh, up north uh, during the time of, of Jesus. Uh, and so Hosea was a prophet of the northern kingdom from around the same time as, as Amos. And what he did is he used the language of idolatry and adultery, handily rather similar in English. He used, every time you see adultery in Hosea, think idolatry. You're worshiping Baal. You're worshiping false gods and you're, you're not doing it right, and you're getting God all wrong. And so he's mad at the violation of the worship that they should be doing. I sometimes have an amusing, amused kind of look at that, and I think, well, Hosea was mad at them because they're worshiping up at altars up in the north. And what's he mad about? Because they're not making the trek down to the temple. Do you know how much it costs to, in time to get from the north down to the south? But, he, but you know, all of these folks say, well, well you, you have to st stop accommodating your distance by creating altars up north. Even an altar to God was an altar in the wrong place. That's why the woman at the well in the fourth gospel talks to Jesus and she says, I can see that you're some kind of a prophet. If you're such a prophet, tell us, where is it that we should be worshiping God? In the temple in Jerusalem or on the mountains, such as we Samaritans, as we Samaritans think? And Jesus, of course, comes back to, it's not about the mountain, it's not about the temple at Jerusalem, it's wherever God is worshiped in spirit and truth. Right? Beautiful answer. But you can tell that issue of where do we worship God and what's good worship and what's bad worship. That's the key issue for Hosea. It's why he uses that adultery, idolatry language. And when he, what he's really upset ab ab about is that. And the thing that's neat is he introduced to our way of thinking for the first time that you can understand God by understanding human relationships. That's key. That was a first. That's what's new about Hosea. You can understand God by understanding human relationships. And the betrayal of human relationships is akin to the betrayal of the people of God with God. It's a beautiful, beautiful meditation on persons and relationships. And uh, what I haven't, uh, I haven't put a slide up here for this, but I'd like to move you to the culmination of these two prophets in the prophet Micah. Could you find Micah in your in your um, text, it should be after um, um, after Amos, a few a few books on, and go to Micah, chapter six. And a lot of people know Micah six eight almost by heart, but I actually want to begin with Micah six chap uh, chapter six verse six. So Micah is another prophet. And my, Micah has a question to uh, is asked a question, and he has to respond as God w with God's response to the question. And the question is this one, and it's in verse six of chapter six: "With what shall I come before the Lord and bow before God Most High?" 
Now, you know what they're having? That tells you right away? It tells you they're having a liturgical argument. Now, I've worked in the church for 30 years, so probably a liturgical argument is not a matter of great hilarity to you. However, it's a matter of great hilarity to anybody who works in the church. Everybody in the parish knows that you, in fact, the old joke, um, and I, I hate the old joke, I'm saying that now because I'm being taped. I hate the old joke, but they say, what's the difference between a liturgist and a terrorist? And they say, you can negotiate with a terrorist. Liturgist joke. And of course, I hate it too, while giggling at it. But li li the argument of what constitutes good liturgy that's an age-old document. People still argue about it. Should it be an organ? Should there be just chants? You probably don't have that argument here because you're a wonderful parish, but you've heard that there are rumors that there are other parishes that are always arguing about whether mass should be silent or whether we should go back to the old way. Remember all of that stuff? All of the arguments about what constitutes good liturgy. Micah has the same problem. And he says, with what shall I come before the Lord? This is what the people ask him. And bow before God most high. In other words, how do I worship properly? And then here come the questions. Shall I come before him with holocausts? In other words, should I show up with a regular, you know, few birds to sacrifice? Or watch how he raises the ante. With calves a year old. Oh, heavy duty heavy-duty uh, sacrifices, not just birds, calves, a year old. And then watch how the ante goes up. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Higher ante again. With, watch this, myriad streams of oil? Oh my gosh, even more expensive. In other words, how expensive does the barbecue have to be? How, how much does the altar have to have by way of sacrifice before God will consider it worthy? Shall I give my firstborn for my crime? Is it, do I actually have to sacrifice my child in order for God to think my worship is good? And here comes the answer. It's a famous text. You have been told, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Only to do justice, in some translations it says the right, but it's, the word is justice. Only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk hum humbly with your God. For the first time in the entire Old Testament, clear as a bell, you have the worship of God on high directly equated with justice issues. We talk, talk about the, the, the perpendicular and the horizontal. How do we worship God both perpendicular and horizontal? How do we worship? Micah puts the two of them together and says you cannot separate them. You want to know how to do worship? Do justice. Love goodness. Walk humbly with God. That would have ticked off an awful lot of people in Ireland who went to church with me when I was a kid because they wouldn't have been remotely interested in hearing that their worship wasn't valuable to God unless it was accompanied by works of justice and a heart that filled, was filled with goodness and expressed goodness. And they would have been very, very ticked off at the idea that their, the value of their worship was equated with the value of their, of their justice doing. Does that make sense? It's radical stuff in Micah. And I know what you're going to say to me. You're going to say, oh, yeah, but I don't know if that shows up in the New Testament. I don't know if Jesus is into that. Okay, let's go there. Turn to the Gospel of John, fourth Gospel. Go towards the end of the Gospel of John. If you get to Acts, you've gone too far. And go to the end. I have to find it, actually. Go to the end, towards the end, it's chapter, actually, it's not the end, chapter uh, 13. Chapter 13, sorry. I was thinking of it as the end because it's already the feast of the Passover and these, you know, they're at the table. Now, your first century listener to, uh, to John's Gospel, well, John's Gospel was probably produced the very end of the first century. So you're an early second century listener to the Gospel of, of John. And you're hearing this reading. 
Before the feast of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. He loved his own in the world and he loved them to the end. The devil had already induced Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot, to hand him over. So during supper, fully aware that his father had put everything into his power and that he had come from God and was returning from God. Now up to there, you know what's coming. Every time there's a table feast in the Gospels, Jesus takes the bread, blesses the bread, and tells people this is the time, at this exact moment, and says, by the way, break bread, this is my body, drink the cup, this is my blood, right? If you're a second century, early second century Christian, you'll have heard Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times, most probably. And so, just like when you go to a movie that you've seen for a thousand times, or just like when I watch re reruns of the West Wing and I know all of the, all of the uh, dialogue back and forth and back and forth, you're getting ready, you know exactly what's coming, right? And all of a sudden, you read, he rose from supper and took off his outer garments takes a towel, ties it around his waist, pours water into a basin, begins to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. And you know the scene. Peter protests, he says, gotta do it, unless I wash you, you'll have no inheritance with me. At exactly the point of the gospel, that in all of the other gospels, Jesus breaks bread. Jesus here takes a towel and becomes a servant to the needs of those who surround him. It is the fourth gospel that makes that they have no Eucharistic feast in the, in the, in the fourth gospel. There is none. Well, the Eucharistic feast is the, is the Passover. The Passover, yes. Well, but no, but I mean the actual breaking of the bread. And there's, there's no, what we would call today the institution narrative. Okay, there's no institution. This is the Last Supper, the, what we would call the Last Supper, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, or it's, uh, or it, let me put it this way, it is the only gathering that correlates to, closest to the, 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 um, the institutional breaking of the bread. Okay, it's the only narrative that, that does that. And, um, and he, he doesn't break, he doesn't, he doesn't do the, this is my body, this is my blood. He doesn't do it anywhere. This is, because the structure in John's gospel is reversed a lot from, from what you have in the others. Um, but it's absolutely extraordinary. So we find ourselves faced with the fact that the early Christians thoroughly knew how Jesus embodied the fullness of what we just saw in Micah worship of God and care for the least among us, care, servant, the servanthood to the world at the ex with, with complete humility. That's what he cared about and that's what the uh, evangelists saw in him. Just fascinating, fascinating. It's almost time for our break. Is this kind of where they, we get Monday, Thursday? Is this where we get Monday, Monday Thursday? I, mm, yes, in as much as it's why we celebrate Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday, the way we celebrate Holy Thursday. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, this, it, it comes from this, exact, from this exact gospel, exactly, right. We're going to take a break, but actually that just brings us right up to kind of today. And we're going to move forward quite quickly now into taking a look at the other strand. Remember I said there were two strands in the Old Testament. One was the saving strand and the other strand was the creator, the God beyond all names and the creator strand. And after the break we'll come back and we'll take a look at that and then we'll see how the New Testament writers understood that when they understood Jesus. Okay, so just a quick break. Three minutes, knowing that you really will only come back in five. Okay? All righty, welcome back. So, we're back. 
And as we head into the spirit, the other spirituality, which won't take as long at all, I wanted to point to you, since we're trying to make the connection now between the ancient Israelites and the New Testament evangelists. We're going to keep making those connections because otherwise what we're always doing is we're looking at Jesus out of context. And we don't ever want to look at Jesus out of context. So one of the things that we see um, develop in the early spirituality of the Christians is a fantastic connection between the Exodus event and the Passover, the, the, the Passover remembrance uh, of the Exodus event. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's they, they saw in the, their developing uh, banquet, the banquet of the Supper of the Lord, they saw in their Eucharistic gatherings a direct um, parallel, if you like, remembering, not just a matter of memory, but a re-embodiment, a remembering of the, uh, of the Passover event. Um, because if you think about the Exodus and if you think about the Passover, what does the Passover do? But it, remember, it, it celebrates the, um, uh, the initiative of God, uh, which called forward an obedient response from the people, their sacrifice and the slaughter of their lambs. It tells of God's deliverance. Uh, uh, and it tells of the formation of the covenant um, uh, of a covenant people, which was the eating of the lamb. And this language of lamb that we still have in our liturgies today, lamb of God. Uh, so the early Christian community saw their Eucharistic gatherings as very much re remembering the Passover event and they were making an easy connection here between the death of Jesus who was who offered himself as sacrifice in the same way as the sacrifice of the lamb was done and we see and in first Peter uh, chapter 1 you see a, um, a, an acknowledgement of the fact that uh, in Jesus and in the Eucharist they see again a reminder that a new covenant was formed so that's why I keep coming Coming back to covenant, covenant, exodus, exodus, such important imagery because their entire, our entire earliest understanding of Jesus post-resurrection have these same echoes of exodus and covenant. So that said, um, here are some other things that might be rather fun and interesting for you to look at. We did not deal with the prophet Jeremiah just because he's just a big, he's a, a big cahoot you know, and we just wouldn't have had time to, to deal with him. He's marvelous, though. Uh, but there are some fascinating parallels that we see um, in the portrayal of Jesus that some of the evangelists, again, found it very beneficial to lean into the particular aspects of Jesus that hearkened to, to Jeremiah. Um, this is the same thing that we do over and over again in our families where we say, um, we'll say something like, uh, oh, that little girl, she's just like my grandma, you know, and we will visit those same traits upon the little girl as we did upon grandma. Not that she's a reproduction of grandma, not that we're making it up, but just there are these, I like the word echoes, that there are these echoings of the traits of one in the traits of the one gone before. And so you see in, um, uh, in Luke's gospel, you see that um, uh, like Jeremiah, Jesus' uh, Jesus's grace was acknowledged already while he was in the womb. Um, uh, Jesus is unmarried, as was Jeremiah the prophet. Um, fascinating amount of resistance um, I I opposition uh, that Jesus received. I mean, we love to think of Jesus' family as supporting him beautifully. Gotta tell you, they, in Mark's gospel, they think he's gone out of his mind very clearly. And Matthew and Luke massaged it a little bit, but there's still some opposition there. And if you think about all of those folks who have, are great prophets, including um, St. Oscar Romero, just, just uh, made a saint. Uh, if you think about the opposition that he uh, received from his close friends and, and those who surrounded him to him becoming a 
tremendous profit in El Salvador. Very, very common, and Luke captured it, um, and, uh, and many scholars see very deliberate parallels to Jeremiah uh, in these examples that I have over the, over the back of my head here. So uh, just something for you to be reminded of, particularly important, is the last one, Jeremiah. If you would, go to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And if you're flipping through looking for the prophets, it goes Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel for the, the big ones. That's if you're, if you're trying to find your spot. Uh, you're going to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Beautiful text, just beautiful. And I, I just love the way we hear God speak in this one. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. See, when you're forgetting that, the te that there was a divided kingdom, house of Israel in the north, house of Judah, J for Judah, J for Jerusalem in the south. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers the day. I took them by the hand to lead them forth from the land of Egypt. I think I told you the first week, 227 times the prophets and the various different texts mention how many times God took them from the land of Egypt. It's a big theme. For they broke my covenant, and that's the other big theme. I love them, I love them, I love my people, I love my people. Gosh, they get it wrong every time. I love my people, I love my people. Oh, they're still messing up. I love my people, I hate my people. They're, <laughs> he gets so mad. He's, we always used to say in, in motherhood when I was a young mom, we used, to, we used to say, you know, I'm just ready to tell the kids, that's it, no more Christmases, ever, for the rest of your life, you know? And then, of course, because you're a loving mother, you say, I will relent. And that's exactly the same dynamic that you hear over and over and over again in the Old Testament. God is ticked off because the folks are not taking care of the widow, the orphan, the alien. They are not doing appropriate worship. They are not observing the covenantal stipulations. And so poor God gets ticked off. And I had to show myself their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will place, I love this, I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Just beautiful, beautiful text. And so if you flick to, uh, to Luke chapter 22, and we won't have time for you to do it, but you'll see also that Jesus is where Jesus says, um, you know, this is the new covenant in my blood, that, that whole idea that Jesus establishes a new covenant in the breaking of the bread and, and the drinking of the cup because of the shedding of his own body and blood in real sacrifice for the people of God. That said, we're going to move quickly to, and I won't to spend long on this one, the spirituality, the second, uh, the second uh, strand of spirituality in the Old Testament, the spirituality of God who saves is what we've had through our connection with the Exodus and the Covenant, and now we're going to the spirituality of God slash mystery slash creator. You know when you open up the Bible and you go to the first book of Genesis, chapter one, and you have that beautiful creation story that is the seven days? That's the perfect example of a text that is an aha moment for the, that expresses an aha moment for the Israelites when they say to themselves, you know what, our God's not just a God who takes care of us and saves us and brings us to the promised land and, and, and lives into his promises and, 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 and uh, asks of us that we be in covenant with him. Our God is actually not just one among many, but is the only God. <laughs> actually is the creator of the whole world. The, the concept of God 
as one God and only one, not just one among many, but one God, was actually a later development for the ancient Israelites. It wasn't, it would take us years to develop the notion of why. I actually was just talking to Michael Dixon on the radio yesterday about this for the, um, the radio, the Catholic radio. Um, so I'm doing a series on Old Testament uh, spiritu- uh, theologies of God uh, for him. I'm not sure it was very coherent, but uh, it was the first, first of a few episodes. And it was on exactly the, this theme, this idea that, that the ancient Israelites began with the concept that their Yahweh God was a great savior God and was absolutely fantastic. And it's a pity that you have the God El and the God Baal, but our God's much better. You know, and they moved from that to, no, no, there's only the one God. And it turns out that this Yahweh God is this extraordinary creator God. And so the seven days narrative is actually a later narrative than the Adam and Eve narrative uh, that comes later in Genesis. And, but it's, it's this marvelous development of a new spirituality, which is our God is the God of all creation. All creation is blessed. And you can kind of see their wonder, what kind of a God creates an entire cosmos like this? Okay, they wouldn't have used the word cosmos, but I'm 21st century, so. But what kind of a God creates a world like this? Wow, what a blessing, that concept of blessing. We are saved early spirituality. We are blessed later later spirituality. It's a beautiful compliment in terms of spiritualities. Our God is a God who absolutely blesses us. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 8, one of my favorite, favorite psalms. You got to go backwards from where we were before. Typically, if you have a Bible without tons of notes at the beginning, you can take the Bible, stick your fingers kind of in the middle, break it open, and you'll get to Psalms. O Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how awesome is your name through all the earth. So you get this vision of the psalmist standing on a mountaintop. Isn't that when we get poetic? standing at a mountaintop, looking at the stars, looking at all of the land around us. And it begins, as all good psalms do, with praise. They begin with praise and end with praise. So how awesome is your name through all the earth. You have set your majesty above the heavens. Then a much uh, argued about phrase, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have drawn a defense against your foes to silence enemy and avenger. Nobody quite knows exactly why those two lines are stuck in there. A quick reference to foes and uh, revenge, uh, avenging. The main part is, comes in verse five. What are humans? That's in my text, it says, what are humans? In the original um, Hebrew, it says, um, what is mortal? Uh, who, 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 what is mortal man? Okay, this is a more inclusive version, but this is the only time in the entire Old Testament that I prefer the uninclusive version to the inclusive version because it helps give you this image that I am a man, I'm a mortal man standing on the mountaintop. What is mortal man? What are humans that you are mindful of them, mere mortals that you care for them? The smallness of people within the context of the wonder of creation. Yet you have made them little less than a god, crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them rule over the works of your hands, put all things at their feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever swims the paths of the seas. And then back to praise again. O Lord, our Lord, how awesome is your name through all the earth. The most beautiful homage, if you like, to our unworthiness to be stewards of all creation. You want to talk about Pope Francis and his concern for the environment? It's at the heart of the mandate here that is the spirituality of the Old Testament that says we are blessed by God 
with this creation and our job is to be stewards of it. Just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So the spirituality that we get in the Old Testament as well as the Exodus text is that God is um, a mystery beyond, God beyond all names. There are probably two dozen different names for God and there's probably about three dozen images for God in the Old Testament. God is, um, is a mother bear protecting her young. Um, there are, uh, guys, there's a marvelous book by Barbara Bow, I think I mentioned it to you last week um, uh, that is this, it's uh, on biblical uh, biblical spirituality uh, the, the subtitle is touching the finger to the flame I think that's the the title of the book biblical spirituality touching the finger to the flame and that is a book that I would say everybody needs to have on their shelf it's beautifully written it's an easy read um, but it's very dense because she covers so much about the spirituality of the Old Testament and then the spirituality of the New Testament all in one slender little book. Marvelous. I think I lent it to somebody which is distressing just, just me greatly. Uh, her name is Barbara Bow, B-O-W-E. She got the Catholic Book Award for it, I remember. Uh, and I believe it's called Biblical Spirituality, Touching a Finger to the Flame. And so in that, she discusses all of the different images for God and names for God. And when we, th when we use God our Father, there's nothing wrong with that, but we should always be conscious of the fact that it never is sufficient and it's only one of many, many names for God. It's very, very important. Otherwise, we, what we do is we, we concretize, we over-concretize the imagery of God our Father. All descriptions of God, by definition, fall are a betrayal of God. They, 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 do, they are not adequate. Nothing is adequate. That's why the Jewish folks call, you know, just talk about the name. Uh, they, they, they don't, they don't even think of uh, actually using the name of God because when you use somebody's name in Jewish culture, you have control in the ancient Israelites. You had, it gave you control over that person. And so they, they oftentimes to this day will call God the name or they will use the word Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord, my Lord. Um, uh, so God is always beyond all names. And I love that. God is always beyond all of our greatest understandings of God. And on the days that we have hard times spiritually living into our attempt to be Jesus in the world, that can, that can help us. God is the one God creator. I mentioned, oops, I mentioned that to you. Um, in the face of an encounter with God, typically in the Old Testament, if you had an encounter with God, you died immediately. You were just, it was just too much for you. Yeah, it was an encounter with death to encounter God. Um, but in, in, what happens is, uh, following the account with Moses, you have this beautiful development of when you have an encounter with God, you don't die, you just take off your feet and you stand in humility before God. Just a beautiful appreciation for the God who is everywhere, um, uh, whom we encounter in the most ordinary of places. That's where we get our spirituality. Jesus lives into this later, and then we developed it in our spirituality, history of spirituality over the years, is where we get our spirituality of seeking first God in the natural, and only afterwards seeking God in the supernatural. I have a lot of friends that I've known over the years who seek God first in the supernatural, and they never, they, they're blind to all of the manifestations of God that are surrounding them. My granddaughter was born this morning, Maya Claire. Beautiful name. Claire was my mom's name. They honored my mom. I had a sense of being in an encounter with something bigger than me this morning. And all it was was that my granddaughter was born far away in Guatemala, but still. Just the coolest thing. Every single day, we encounter little small moments that are moments of goodness, 
moments that don't always shout out that they're an encounter with God, but oftentimes if you walk away and if you enter into some reflection uh, or some examine of conscience at the end of the day or something like that, you'll find yourself saying, I believe I saw God in that today. Do you ever have those moments? They're beautiful. They're wonderful when you find them in reflection. They're magic when you find them in the moment themselves. When you happen to be in the moment and experiencing that awe and it's almost wordless, right? Just a marvelous encounter. We get that spirituality originally and first from the ancient Israelites. Um, they really understood the responsibility that we have by virtue of the fact that we are, and we don't like this, but we are co-creators with God of the world. Oftentimes that sounds as if we're trying to make ourselves God. People will say, oh, well, that sounds new age. Not a bit new age. It's Old Testament spirituality. It comes very much from the spirituality that's present in the wisdom literature, which we will not spend time on the wisdom literature as rich as it is. We won't have time to get into that entire uh, section of the Old Testament. But from the wisdom literature comes this marvelous idea of uh, wisdom, the feminine wisdom, being present at the moment of creation with God. And then since Jesus is the wisdom, the, the new wisdom of God in embodied, then this whole wisdom figure who was uh, present at creation is absolutely kind of echoed again in the, in the New Testament. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, the holiness of God, uh, they understood that the holiness of God was tabernacling in the midst of the people. Isn't that a beautiful image? If you think about the, the, um, th that whole respect that that they had for the Holy of Holies, for God present with them in the desert, and that, that idea of God tabernacling. Pitching tent was the original expression. God pitches God's tent among his holy people. I love the image of tabernacling. Um, I have two stories on that that I, I want to get to because I think it, it, it helps us in our spirituality. The first one is that um, if God, God tabernacles in the midst of human beings, God pitches God's tent inside of us. I, uh, I express this um, uh, this way. When I was a child, I was afraid of the dark. And we lived in an old rambling, big old rambly kind of house and it was just creaky and, and, and old. And when it was dark at nighttime and the trees uh, shook outside, it was just scary and I was always afraid of the dark. And so for years and years, well into my adulthood, I just didn't ever care to be in the dark. And then one fine day, as I was becoming a little bit more learned in biblical texts, I discovered that, um, uh, that, I, that God tabernacles, I came across the expression that God tabernacles with us into our womb. And I thought, wait a minute, darkness doesn't have to be the darkness of a cave, a scary darkness of something dangerous. Darkness can be the darkness of the womb. And I suddenly realized that what the ancient Israelites were very, very clear on is that the word for womb in Hebrew has to do with the consonants that make the sound the harem or herem. It's basically kind of like an H and an R and an M. They don't do much with vowels in Hebrew. So, uh, so the, the H, the R, and the M. And womb and mercy have the same three consonant letters in Hebrew. The connection between God of mercy and God of womb is a very tightly knit spirituality in the Old Testament. And I remember saying to myself, isn't that fascinating? The God of mercy, whom the ancient Israelites developed through, through this other second stream of spirituality, the God of mercy is the God of the womb, the indwelling God who pitches, pitches his tent within us. Suddenly all fear went away. 
because there's nothing to be afraid of when the darkness that surrounds us is the darkness of the womb, the darkness of God's mercy. When Pope Francis did the Year of Mercy a few years ago, we did a lot of stuff around mercy in the Hebrew Bible and mercy in the context of, of our faith. So God tabernacles in the midst of people. God's mercy is ours in the midst of, uh, in the midst of his people. And what's, uh, uh, what's uh, fascinating is there's a connection. I'm going to go quickly to the next. I believe it's in the next one. Um, the connection to the fourth gospel, to John's gospel. We had talked about this at, at the break. Um, in John's gospel, you get the closest connection to the creator spirituality the, uh, and the, its blend with the saving spirituality. In the fourth gospel, you notice that Jesus isn't, uh, isn't actually born in the fourth gospel. There's no birth narrative. There is in Matthew, there is in Luke, but there's none in John, and there's none in Mark. Uh, but in John's gospel, instead of having a birth narrative, if you go to the beginning of John's gospel, you see that what you get is an image of God's action in the context of creation, and Jesus is brought ba back all the way to the time of creation for, uh, for uh, God's, uh, God's involvement, if you like, with Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God. Suddenly, we don't have a narrative about Jesus born in Bethlehem. We don't have a narrative of him in, in a stable. We now have a narrative of Jesus being present at the dawn of creation. So, we've just made the leap. Creation, spirituality from the Old Testament, creation spirituality used by John in the New Testament, creation spirituality that we speak every Sunday in our creed. Isn't it cool? It's really just fabulous. The other thing that happens in the fourth gospel is there are deliberate echoes over and over and over again um, to give the listeners hints. I'm really talking about Yahweh. I'm really talking about Yahweh, the God, the creator God. You see, Yahweh actually means something like I am who am, or I am the one who is, or I am who is. There are all sorts of variables to those, those uh, the, uh, letters that are supposedly representative of the name of God. And all over the Gospel of John, you, you know, as you go through it, I think I highlighted it all at, at one stage, uh, going through my poor, unfortunate, battered Bible here. Um, and uh, you can see it starting off around John chapter 6. Uh, the Jews murmured about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. If that isn't a very clear reference to Yahweh, I am, and the bread that came down from heaven, the manna for the people in the, in the desert. Again, in chapter 6, further on, in verse 47, I am the bread of life. 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. He's kind of repetitive on this one. And it goes on and on and on. I think I put a circle around every single I am. Uh, here it is in chapter 8. This is why I told you, you will, uh, you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You will realize further down that I am. And then, I am the light of the world. It's just over and over again. You know when you sing a song, or when you hear a song, and then the singer has made a refrain, and by the end of the song you say, I get it, I get it, that's the title of the song, I really get it, you could stop singing the refrain now. If you were ever to be of a mind to be a smidge impatient with the fourth gospel, you might say to Jesus, I get it, I get it. You are the, you are, that's where we get our spirituality, our theology of Jesus as the one God, uh, Jesus as God. It's spelled out in the fourth gospel. Um, he is, of course, the full-hearted offering of himself as the one who, he gives himself as the one who saves. So that's the saving spirituality, the other strand of spirituality from the Old Testament that comes in. I'm not just the creator God, I am the God who saves. How do I save? By offering my body completely for the good 
of the world. Eucharist as servanthood, as we mentioned earlier, and I would su submit that we have in that the echoes of Micah for that verse that we, those verses that we looked at earlier, where we said, um, uh, uh, if, you are, if you were to thoroughly worship God, you worship God in the perpendicular and you worship God in the horizontal. You say, this is the kind of worship that I desire. Do justice, you know, walk humbly with your, love justice and walk humbly with our God. Love goodness and work. <gasps> I get it right. Walk humbly with our God. Uh, so, so what we've done is we've looked over the last few weeks at the Old Testament and how it's kind of teeing us up for the New Testament. What we'll do next week is we'll, we'll do some very quick run through the favorite texts that I believe indicate to us, in, indicate where we get our understanding of sacraments from. We'll take a look at healing. We'll take a look at what baptism does for, uh, for the new community. We'll take a look at uh, the, very, um, uh, the very context of what it is to be confirmed. We took a quick peek at those the very first week, but we'll come back to some of those texts. Uh, but then what I'd really like to move us to is what, do our, what does it look like to be uh, people who are involved in sacramental living? We come right up to today then and we'll take a look at what are the questions that I have to ask myself and what I'd like the way I'd like to tackle that with your permission is is this um, I'd like to take a look at what 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 we mean when we say that we have experienced conversion a lot of people when they say they've experienced conversion they say they've experienced a conversion religiously but I would submit that there are about five different ways of experiencing conversion. And now what do, do those different conversions look like with respect to the way in which we live the sacraments? So if I have experienced the sacrament of matrimony, what does conversion look like? What does it mean? What are the questions then that I have to ask myself every single day? Does that make sense? You recall that I mentioned that my hope is to make you as uncomfortable in your, in your, uh, in your serenity as I am in mine. Um, I believe that the Christian life is not supposed to lull us to complacency. I believe we are really called, the Gospels call, uh, call us to, um, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And many times, if we happen to be comfortable, we have to find ways in which the Gospels are afflicting us. So, if you don't like that idea, don't come back next week, but I really hope you come back. <laughs> okay. Good so far? All right. Any suggestions? I'm happy to hear them. And uh, thank you all, and we will see you next time. Have a good evening. <laughs>